we had quite a break uh, of four months uh, since the last crew call, but um, a lot of things happened. Um, and I put this uh, bird here um, as today's quiz because uh, I can say that much. It's a female bird. And um, I actually observed the female bird and it looks quite different uh, from the male bird. And the male bird, both of them are, uh, are quite rare. And it's a rare sight. So um, do you know which bird it is? Maybe a chimp. Huh? Is it a chimp? G-I-M-P. In, in, in German? No, in English. No, no, no. behind you. Huh? You can. Yeah, you cheating. <laughs> you can find it there. <laughs> it was. It was. It was sitting at the very top of uh, a Pinus silvestris, which is uh, usually the tree where they feed on, and we we go into it afterwards. If nobody knows, it's anyway. It's a, a nice, uh, a nice piece of nature to explore. We call it yellow heart in Georgia. So. <laughs> Yellow heart in Georgia? I think so. Uh, it would be interesting mm -hmm. to figure out afterwards. Can so, um, yes, we have an, a, a quick arrival round. So, um, whoever would like to start. I mean, we are always in the same uh, kind of environment, but nevertheless, let's follow this. How are you? Where are you? What's in your mind? Who would like to start? I can start. <laughs> I'm pretty good. I'm very happy with uh, finishing uh, everything that we would like to show today. And um, it's a beautiful day today in St. Fulton, blue sky. And um, yeah, that's it. Um, I'll pass it to Gloria. Hello to everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm good also. Like, yeah, just, as Lucas just said, yeah, it's one of the most beautiful day of October, probably, because it's been quite rainy recently. So finally, we have time. And uh, I'm supported also at one of the side of our big table. So I'm happy because we have a very full office today. And um, yeah, I'm excited to see what Luger is going to show. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> okay, let's go next. I move to Hans. Ah, thank you, Gloria. Yeah, really uh, happy to join today. I'm still digesting all the wonderful memories uh, with you guys in uh, Obergrafendorf at the Mitmach conference and uh, also a few uh, bilateral uh, connections still intact or building up, I would say, uh, with, the, um, with the transition network. Uh, but now, of course, we, we have to uh, follow up also on the ARC developments. I'm really curious what you have developed and we'll be happy to give my feedback. Then I'm handing over to Petra. Oh. <laughs> Hello, I'm, I'm doing okay. Actually not so motivated these days, despite the weather. Um, and I'm also in some person and I was just uh, doing some things um, regarding the, the nature guide training. And so that's the last thing that was on my mind. <laughs> And I'll pass it on to, well, Knuls is the next one I see on my screen. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm a bit sickish this week. Um, obviously, also in St. Burton. And um, I had a, a really great call this uh, afternoon with uh, a teacher running um, an informal program in an international school. So what's on my mind is really how to uh, get um, our work out and implement it in schools. That's really what is a lot on my mind now. I'm handing over to um, Chaba. Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm also in St. Paul, and I'm also really happy about the weather. It's really warm. And uh, it's on my mind is this quick call and uh, it's my laptop because it has any kind of sound right now and I don't know what's happening. And I will pass to Christina. Okay. Uh, I'm also good. I'm also in the full time. And on my mind, yeah, it's actually the first time participating in this kind of call. So I'm interested to see how it will go and what it is going to be. 
Oh, and I'm passing out to later. Sorry, I forgot about that. Hello, I'm good. And I'm in some Polten too. And what's on my mind is about the walk for tomorrow and how we're going to get there. <laughs> I'm very proud of my class. <laughs> and is there someone else? You? Yeah, yeah. me. Okay, yeah. Uh, I am good. Yeah, you good. I'm in Sankt Pölten as well, and on my mind is what I was just reading before about uh, tree microhabitats. So yeah, that's still in my mind. And I will pass to Sonia. Hello, I'm good. I just arrived. Uh, what's on my mind is I'm curious to, to see how everyone uh, thinks about the new functions. <laughs> okay, good. Then um, let's move forward. Um, so you, you have seen this already. Um, we have quite a long list of things that we want to show you today. However, the focus is on mapping non-trees, uh, non-tree features and uh, points of interest. Um, so let's uh, go um, into media's release. We have always a little introduction. So what is the background for this release? Um, most of you know that this is a sort of a guiding statement uh, by Ken Robinson, that there is not only a crisis in natural resources, but also one in human resources, and the two are connected. That's why we focus on transforming education. Um, our solution is networked and gamified place-based education, and we have uh, three pillars here. One is uh, that we try to take um, students, children, as much as possible outdoors. We walk, we apply base-based education, we experience our ecosystems and we develop a bioregional curriculum and we try to create gamified learning environments. We play um, as far as this is possible in different age groups. Today, we're going to focus quite uh, a lot on how we uh, add a functionality to developing bioregional curricula. So, um, most of you know this slide already, but we, we thought we'd recap this today. We live in a world that is defined by nation states. There are about 200 of those, and the borders are rather artificial. Uh, they have a cultural history, but uh, a lot of those borders are actually in conflict with uh, how we should govern our planet. And this needs to change. And there is a new world map uh, consisting of 844 ecoregions, which you see here. Now, this might seem very abstract, and we need to bring this down into a real um, learning experiences in the places in which we live. So this is why we thought today we uh, go back into this concept of bioregional education. What is it actually? So bio and ecoregions are defined through almost identical flora and fauna, the natural environment, also watersheds, but also the cultural parts, the local populations, the knowledge and solutions developed in these areas. And this is what bioregional education should stress. And when you look at the right side, there is this graph that I actually only found yesterday in a research article. Usually we have here in New Zealand, but since we are all in Europe, I thought, okay, let's use an ecoregion map of Europe. And what is interesting about this map is you see the patchwork. There are no clear borders. So whenever we speak about bioregions or ecoregions, you don't have those clear boundaries that also Lisa was struggling lately in, in Berlin. Um, it is a patchwork of areas where the same species, uh, flora, fauna, uh, exists. So bioregional education should teach about these territories. Uh, but when you really do it uh, in a school, um, in a city, uh, in any place, then bioregional education turns into place-based education. And it is nothing more than a modern version of indigenous learning. And it has four pillars, and we, we want to recap them today. So it's a learning method which uses the school environment as a starting point for practical experiences. Practical, not theoretical. So primary experiences that really um, you can experience through your feet, through your body, through your hands, and not just through school books. 
then the neighborhood problems are recognized as the most important resource for learning. So students should really go outdoors and deal with the problems they encountered there. But in order to do that, they really need to first figure out what are the problems. And if you go into most schools nowadays, they're completely alienated of their environment. Uh, if I talk to teachers in my school, they commute to school every day. They don't know anything about the environment of the school. Um, and that's the standard in most schools. Um, it should foster systems understanding and create a sort of a holistic empathy towards the environment. That's the third pillar. And the fourth and probably the most important pillar is that students should be perceived as the most important resource to solve the problems that we encounter in our ecosystems. Um, might sound a bit theoretical, but um, we do it through the trails, quite, quite hand, hands on. So how do you grow bioregional identities? If you apply bioregional learning, you need to build a bioregional curriculum. And this, in the end, should lead to the bioregional identities. We develop activities, could be a horse ride, uh, a canoe ride, uh, a walk, uh, anything really, orientation run. You collect it with uh, species, specimen, mapped trees so far, and then you create the route. But what is new, and this is what Lucas is gonna show you, is that in addition to species and specimen, we're gonna have also features and points of interest. So you see the difference? That's basically what is new. And that's what we're gonna discuss a little bit more in detail. Um, why is all this important? Why are bioregional identities important? Because mainstream education alienates, uh, especially children and youth from the planet and communities. So when you look into national curricula, there is always the content, the different subjects, there is money put into it, there is time of teachers. Um, you have lessons that last 50 minutes or maybe two hours. You have a certain attitude, but it doesn't really matter where, if you look into curricula, um, there is no mentioning of space. So this is really the blind spot and bioregional identities focus on space. Uh, you need to explore the environment around school. We show you today a pilot project that we prepared over the last three months, I would say, and where we already applied this concept with not having actually the functionalities on the ARC. Um, and that was in Obergrafendorf where also Hans joined us. And what we did is we engaged with a, a local middle school, um, seventh grade. We asked them to prepare a decoration um, for the main square in the form of uh, EMA boards. That's a uh, uh, Shinto tradition from Japan where people can write a little boards, um, their prayers, their wishes, their dreams for the local environment, but also for the planet. Um, works very well. I actually was there um, yesterday and the boards are still there and quite some boards were added by the local population. So this is something that students prepared, but it really activated the local community um, to dream for something better. Um, then the second activity, actually, Gloria, you want to mention this a bit because you led that workshop? Yeah, this was about creating the Shimoku decorations and for the trees, so based on the Shinto practice, on the Japanese Shinto practice, in which we had like white papers and we created those uh, uh, shida, right? And, uh, and then we created sort of bracelet with wooden animals and then they were hanging from the trees together with the shida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in both workshops, we had about 30 students. Uh, one was more crafty, this one really more artistic. Um, and actually yesterday, all the paper, the shida were gone. They were washed off by the mm -hmm. rain, but uh, those bracelets, um, they were still there and they really still look very nice. So um, what you see on this slide is how we decorated it together with the students. Um, on the right side, you see after the decoration, a nice picture with some of the students of uh, one of those trees that we mapped. Uh, you see a picture of uh, adults taking the walk. On the left top, you see uh, us, part of the team, together with uh, representatives of the local government actually designing the walk. 
And uh, this is a, a new uh, EMA that I found yesterday. It's, mm. I don't know who wrote it, but um, it's it's very nice. Um, okay. So I, I took a, a picture yesterday and added it to the slide deck. Mm. So this is how you can activate uh, a local community, whether it's a school or people, and create something together. It's really about participation. And that's what we want with this project. We, we developed the ARC as a digital backbone. But in the end, it's it's uh, work and learning in the real world. And that's um, a picture we took with uh, the adults actually then uh, doing the walk. And you see also on the left side, there is an info board. Uh, the local government sponsored 20 of such boards. Um, I got the bill yesterday. So they paid, but they told me it's more than 700 euros that they invested in this. And they stay there for good. So this is a real a legacy that we leave in this village. Um, and I hope that the local school is going to continue this project. Um, yeah, and having shown um, this local project, what we want to tell you now is how you could do this in your own hometown, wherever you are. And Lucas is going to share this new POI uh, mapping points of interest functionality. Cool. So, oh. yeah. Yeah, Actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> I jumped something. Something missing. Yeah, uh, I jumped something. Um, there is more that I want to share first. So um, we um, we went into um, we went. But is it coming? That's not a good question. Mm -hmm. Yes. So no, it's not shared. No. It's if not we, shared yet. See the black line. You see black line. I'm gonna do this again. Uh, now here it's there. It is. Mm -hmm. So um, before Lucas actually shows you the functionality, we, we thought as an entry to the functionalities, we go into the arc and uh, show you this walk. And um, I have it open here. So when you are on the arc and you you enter inside, you need to go into the commons. Um, and in the commons, you pick the respective uh, uh, municipality. This is Obergrafendorf. In Obergrafendorf, uh, we have this one quest that we created for this uh, conference. And um, you click on the quest. Mm -hmm. And then you see the overview map. And you see we mapped 20 different stops. And uh, Gloria and me, we're going to introduce first three stops so that you see the difference between nature uh, and culture mappings. Um, so I'm going to start here with stop three. It's uh, uh, Tidia Cordata. And while you could go on the arc into the stop and see a lot of information about this tree, uh, Gloria is going to show with you now uh, the quiz that oh. we attach to it. Yeah. So... Uh, we still do you want to do yes? Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. You see? So once you walk in front of the tree and you click into the QR code, you get this question. So since this was one of the few trees that we mapped in the full walk, we decided to use some of our standard questions that we also use for many of our nature walks. So this is very much based on, um, this is very much for yeah, environmental education. So to teach you something about trees and it's something that can be used for many other types of trees. And so for example, which question is asking, look at the leaf and match it with the right leaf shape. So of course you should look at the tree in front of you, look at the leaf, which is out. And in this case is a linde. If any of you is familiar with the linde might know the answer. Uh, tell me, Sophia, you say? For day. For day. Let's pick it up. See, check. Yay. OK. Was then this is super easy again. So which tree do we have in front of us now? I already said. <laughs> um, I mean, actually, we have two cordate leaves in these pictures. <laughs> so it's a bit confusing. But I said it's a linde. So it's actually a small leaf line. Okay. I will tell you. Because the princess tree is much larger leaf. And uh, now we also want to introduce some concept of ecosystem services, let's say. So we have developed a few questions to teach people what are the problems that trees 
urban trees can encounter in cities, for example, like soil sealing, because this is stopping the water from penetrating in the ground. So what we want to people to observe is like, for example, how much uh, soil is sealed around this tree. And because this tree was actually planted at the side of a big street, it had a pretty large surface of the concrete. So one of the answers that you need to pick here is definitely solid soil. And the other would be a bit of loose soil as well. There is no water, so those are the two options. And then also on the topic of ecosystem services, we want people to think, uh, so what ecosystem services can trees provide? Who wants to pick the answers? <laughs> <laughs> so please. <laughs> yeah, be serious, come on. Yes. Carbon sequestration. Okay, then. Well, I'm not allowed to be frivolous. Five, five, five. <laughs> Home for biodiversity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Great, we've done the tree, and now we got our BMG card with all the ecosystem services down there. Yeah, I think it's uh, worth to mention that uh, the first two questions were auto-generated, so these are available out of the box for any uh, trees in the system. You don't really need to create them, whereas the last two questions were Custom. customized. You can just create and ask anything you want. And now you can also create quizzes in there so you can make a public poll. And yeah, okay. and when you click on the bottom icons, you can learn more about the ecosystem services. This whole card is fully interactive. All right. Um, so then let's go back again to our map of this walk, of our pilot project. Um, and we pick uh, stop seven, okay? So stop seven, uh, as opposed to stop three, is not about nature, it's about culture. Because they have a very, very nice sort of haunted castle there because it's, uh, it's falling apart. Um, and this castle we mapped as a cultural stop, as a cultural point of interest. So again, if I go into the stop here, there's a lot of information online, but the interactive quiz that you can actually only play when you are in front of this uh, stop uh, is going to be introduced again by Gloria. Okay, so let's wake up the crowd again. We need to just check. Yeah. yeah. Oops. No? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we only have one question for this stop. There is a huge palace in front of you which with bullet holes all over the the face, the facade. Uh, can you can read the answer and tell me which one you think is the most uh, I think it's suitable. the last one. Okay, Jabba, pick the last one. <laughs> no, 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 you, you just tell me. I want to see someone else pick something different. Sounds plausible. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then well, let's look for this one. Check. Wow. No, you got it immediately. <laughs> it was too easy. <laughs> okay. In this case, of course, you see there are no ecosystem services down there, but it only tells you which uh, common cities and ecoregion. And... There are no bats under the rooftop. <laughs> what? No bats. bats. No. <laughs> Maybe. Can be the idea. <laughs> Yeah, okay. But uh, um you, you collect basically culture and arts uh an impact point. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's right. it's always the designer deciding uh where you, you do your learning. <clears throat> okay, and so we have one third um example prepared. So I'm gonna share again. Um gonna go back to my screen and I go to the POIs. You see again the map of the walk. And what we have now is already our standard kind of stop, the tree, prominent tree. We have now a cultural point of interest, the castle. And the third stop is 11, and this is going to be about a natural feature and quite an interesting one. Um, it's called here Pilach uh, Nature Reserve because they want to set up a nature reserve in that town. 
And again, uh, if you go here into the stop, you have online a lot of information um, actually showing in this location how it changed um, over the years. So in the 18th century, this is the top map, probably not so visible on your screen. Um, you have a very swampy area uh, with a lot of water absorption. And then in the 1930s, about 100 years ago, this uh, swampy riverbed was turned into a single canal. Um, and this is what happened all over uh, Europe, maybe even uh, the Western world, that we uh, created industrial landscapes. And what happens is that the water um, is drained very fast. And uh, this was the, the major aha and systems learning effect when we did the walk and created the walk, but I think also for the participants, because they realized that the flood might be connected with uh, such landscapes. And Gloria is now uh, showing you uh, again the quiz. Okay, look at, yeah. Let's play a game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and at the end, it's always you playing. So, what are the ecological consequences of regulating a riverbed? I think we kind of already mentioned one. Increased Yes. <laughs> what else? The last one. Mm, yeah, I mean, the other things are pretty positive, so this one. it's not very yeah. realistic. Okay, let's see. <laughs> we'll check. I'm oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Aha. This is a bit more complex. So um, if the flood that just happened like last month, uh, was uh, would have occurred without the industrial design of river landscape. So if we would have left the river like flowing in its natural way, we would have added. I more options are of course right. So we can also. Who wants to shoot? Is the first one. Let's start. I mean, there is more than one. Yeah, one is the first one. Okay, one. Yeah. good. The good. one is the last one. One is the last one. Good. Is there more? Uh huh. Oh. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> why do you see? Third one. The third one. Yeah. yeah. Check. <laughs> Yes, okay. congratulations. <laughs> you got two points. Yeah, I think what we have demonstrated here is that this uh, systems understanding, this learning about ecosystems is something that uh, can be incorporated in such stops. And um, this is something that is really hard to teach in a classroom. Um, so that's that's quite an interesting example, I think. All right. Um, I think we're done here. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. Um, and it's Lucas' turn to show us how to create such um, interactive trails um, wherever you are. All right. So, um, yeah, hello. You might uh, remember um, that creating the walks was always possible only with the trees, and um, we got a lot of feedback of we would like to include more stuff in our quests, in our walks, in our formats. So um, how does it look like now when this is possible? When we started the landing page, uh, instead of mapping a tree, you can now map something, anything. Maybe we could change it to map anything. And uh, with this button, you land right into the mapping tool. Uh, if you are a little bit familiar with the arc, that's the uh, functionality that you access from the top right corner on the phone, and it allows you to uh, add points of interest, so trees, um, natural and man-made things uh, that you can then work with. And um, so when you now add a new mapping, uh, instead of being brought directly into the form, you get a um, selection of some categories that uh, we uh, pre-selected. Um, how did we 
find this selection, we decided to um, grow more uh, interconnected with the project of OpenStreetMaps, which you might know as um, basically community of cartographers creating a, a free as in freedom open source map. Uh, so we are adapting the system of uh, storing and um, displaying things. Um, and we have pre-selected things that are useful for uh, nature walks, um, but you always have the possibility of other, and that in the future will let you suggest uh, more categories to uh, basically work with. So if you want to map a tree, then you get into the form in the way that you know it with um, all the uh, bells and whistles for calculating ecosystem services. But if you are to map anything else, so let's say you want to map um, a bird height, um, which as I learned is not um, a hitting place for the birds, but for the birders. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> um, you basically only have to enter the location and uh, after that, you can put the images, the notes, and that's it. So it's vastly simplified um, because all the other informations are necessary only to calculate the ecosystem services. So that's uh, what it looks like in the mapping tool. Um, after you map the points of interest, you can find them inside of uh, your current commons. So let's have a look at this. I will go into not St. Fulton, but into Open Grafendorf, because that's where we have the most points of interest. And uh, you might notice that your favorite tab, the specimens tab, is gone, and it's been replaced by the points of interest tab. And um, here is where all the mappings live. By default, you can see everything um, all mixed. So we have introduced some filters, so it's easier to find what you're looking for. And the filter has two levels. So first, you can decide if you want to see things related to nature or to culture. So the culture basically encompasses all man-made uh, categories, structures, and the nature, all the natural. Um, so let's have a look what it looks like. If I select culture, I can see everything inside of uh, the man-made category, and I can narrow it down with the second level filter. So mm -hmm. I can, for example, only look for, um, what do we have here? Um, okay, culture and arts, which is apparently all the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and instead of uh, creating a new specimen, you create a new point of interest and then you already saw that. So then what's the next step? Next step is um, taking what you have mapped and making either a quest or a guided walk out of it. And uh, that's pretty much what Gloria has already shown. And that's how this whole walk came to be. So after I observe something, after I finish the walk, it's always a good idea to go back into my profile and check how my bioregional identity has grown. So I can see the main number in here, but I can also click into that and see what does that mean. And uh, besides the species and specimens, which are basically the species yeah, and the trees. We've got a third slider where I score very high. And uh, you, this basically is showing what are, uh, how many of the other non-tree points of interest I have already observed in this commons. And if I go into the observations tab, then I can see everything one by one, also mm -hmm. showing what it was what it is and uh, where I have gained it. All right, so I think that's it. For... Maybe maybe also show the new icons on the map because that's also ah, right. really nice. All right. Um, 
the map view of that is showing both if you have already observed mm -hmm. or not, but also it's showing what it is. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. And, that, and that's both available for routes and for quests. Yeah, exactly. So maybe just to make it clear, the quests are the self-guided um, form where people are either scanning the QR codes on the trees or on the boards, or there is the geocaching mode where you are following the map and as soon as you are 10 meters or closer from the uh, stop, then this quiz pops up. Yeah, so as you can see, the categories are sometimes we were uh, thinking, okay, where should I put this? Um, I don't know. Uh, we don't, we saw, okay, ah, we don't have a river. Ah, and uh, if you want to map something and you cannot find what you're looking for, uh, get in touch and uh, we extend the possibilities together. Cool. Any questions? Otherwise, I have a totally different topic for you. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going. The second part of this release is the activities dashboard. So if you have uh, worked with the uh, ARC in the past, um, the dashboard was really uh, not pretty. And uh, that's why for the conference where we were uh, basically helping to organize it and helping with the signups and everything, um, we saw it as a good opportunity to um, improve the dashboard. And yeah, Sonia did a lot of work on that. So let's have a look what it looks like. Uh, this is the event page of uh, the event where we are currently in, in the group role. And the dashboard um, brings you okay, some basic information about the event, the overview of the sales, which um, we didn't make much. Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, then we've got the overview of the bookings, um, where you can basically edit the booking, you can cancel it, transfer it to another uh, event if this is uh, wrong. You can manage the payment status. Um, ah, Mila booked. Mila booked? Here? Oh. And, yep. Yeah. Pretty much, hopefully, everything that you need. You can add people, you can search for people. And um, then, after uh, you have managed your bookings, you are at the check in desk and you are working with the participants tab uh, where you can basically see who is coming and you can check them in. So, um, I will just check everyone in. Except for me. Uh, yeah, but Mila is not here, so mm. I'm going to uncheck Mila. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> after the event, you work with the Impact Points tab, um, where you can see who was there. And again, you can award the Impact Points um, to everyone who has participated. Yeah, so this might be hard to appreciate if you didn't see the previous dashboard, but this is really... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Much cleaner. Yeah, maybe another feature that is in here is uh, you can basically create a QR code with which people can join the event mm -hmm. uh, like on spot without buying the ticket. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Maybe also important to mention um, that there are two ways. Uh, Hans already asked about routes and quests. All the quests are those digital self guided ones. So you don't need to do this check in. You don't need to use this dashboard. It's all happening automatically. Uh, when you join uh, such a quest, you get your points automatically to your profile. But this is, for example, what we did with this group of adults that you saw under the tree. Um, we gave them the points after the walk. Yeah. Also, I will mention, uh, according to popular demand, we added uh, 
CSV export. So now you can uh, uh, go back to Excel uh, as you used to. And of course you can collect, uh, load the collected trash, duplicate, or bring your activity into the best practice. All the functionalities um, state nothing is lost. Cool. So that's the dashboard. Um, the next thing that uh, is part of this release is allowing to attach species and specimens not only to routes, so basically to um, uh, yeah, a walk, but also to normal events. And uh, why we thought about that is because sometimes we have activities like the one that uh, you can see now in front of you, which is decorating a single tree. So if we wanted to uh, let the participants collect this specimen card into their profile, um, we had to say this is a route. And it's not really a route. It's just one tree. So what you can do now is uh, you can add specimens uh, into any kind of event. We removed this limitation. Um, so yeah, basically after you after the event, you go into the dashboard, you do all the uh, stuff like in uh, that I just shown. And besides the impact points, just like in walks, you have the by original identity tab where you can award uh, the points of interest and specimens. Um, I, I just want to think here uh, loudly. That's something very spontaneous because I saw that you were um, doing research on microhabitats and trees. Now think about this. Um, we, we decided to make actually a cultural and a nature application happen in one single species. But um, some people talk about large trees as uh, motherships of biodiversity mm -hmm. because there is so much life in a single tree. Now, if we have a cultural event like this uh, Japanese tree decoration, mm -hmm. you, you, you have a cultural activity that maybe lasts an hour or something but then you can match it with something really about the ecosystem, about the nature that you want to teach maybe kids there. And this is what then is really kind of creating interest and engagement. Um, and that's not possible to also show um, as a learning outcome. In schools, it's very important to visualize what you have done. Yeah. And uh, we can do it now. Yeah, so to continue with uh, things that happened, um, one more thing that we wanted to mention is that um, everyone who signs up for the ARC now gets a um, welcome message, which is basically a little self-contained uh, manual introduction into what you can do with the platform. Um, we have just translated it into German, and we hope to extend the possible uh, languages for this. Um, the next thing that we wanted to say is that now it is very easy to find the ARC on Google Play, which is the exact opposite of the previous state, which was impossible. So um, it was impossible. because we only put it there as ARC, uh, which is too generic to, to be found. Now you can simply search for Green Steps ARC. It says my screen sharing is paused. Resume share, right? Yeah, so you enter Green Steps Arc, and we are on the first place. Very proud of our SEO skills. <laughs> and we have more than 100 downloads. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Give us reviews. Yes. Five stars. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Got it. OK, and then uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention is that you still see my screen, yes, right? Yes. Um, so we've always been an open source project, but the repository and the whole development was not advertised anywhere. And that is now changed. Uh, we have cleaned up of uh, some sensitive information secrets that were committed by mistake. And we are now proudly and fully uh, in open space with all our development. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the page and uh, see 
uh, in here in development, the source code. You are transported directly into our GitLab space. And um, yeah, you can see what's going on in our issue board and issues and um, check out the code and um, send merge requests. Collaborate with us on building the platform. You can see the license, which is uh, a GPL version three, um, which is um, um, fully open open source license. Yeah, we hope that uh, we get more um, traction through um, embracing uh, fully open source development, which is what we wanted to do from the very beginning. That's it from my side, from sharing what's new in this release. OK, so then maybe do a quick recap before we go into the Q&A session. Um, I'm sharing my screen in a second. Here we go. A summary, I mean, that was really a lot. Um, that Lucas shared, but it was four months since our last release, uh, our crew call. So I would just like to focus on the mapping PUI um, feature. What we can do now is that we create educational trails, which include natural and cultural features. Uh, we can develop bioregion identities within the commons and municipality. And it's not anymore just half the story, it's the complete story. Uh, I think this is a very powerful tool for schools and students. Uh, we can choose between guided walks with info boards that maybe you know a city government wants to sponsor or a private um, a private company that is interested in supporting such a project um, and the interactive quest we can choose between the geocaching mode and the qr codes that you scan with your mobile phone and you can play um, all the routes that you develop alone or with your friends in the multiplayer mode so it's really a, um, a very interesting complete package, I think, that uh, can go and spread uh, wherever there is interest. Um, what is important to mention is that there are really uh, USPs for schools that are not to be underestimated. Um, with the ARC as a backbone, we can accelerate now place-based school development. W what does this mean and what are the outcomes for schools? And uh, this is not, uh, my writing, this is uh, 20 years of research of an American uh, um, a teacher and a university professor, David Sobel, mostly is writing about this. You get out of place-based education, higher motivation, academic achievement, of course, also better health because kids are outdoors doing stuff in nature. Uh, you can support with uh, our application educators in dealing with new frame conditions of kids just being more hooked to screen time and less uh, uh, moving around in the outdoors. You can uh, do strategic outdoor curriculum development. Um, you can organize the outdoor learning space meaningfully. And I want to underline this, double underline, because all the uh, tools that you use in schools currently, like School Fox or Web Untis, whatever there is, they focus on the indoor environment. It's about the classrooms. So we have here really a, a novel application for the space surrounding the schools. And uh, what the ARC also does with the bioregion identity is that you can assess and communicate uh, education for sustainable development progress clearly. You can really show uh, the progress that students and teachers make in this realm. And now we have um, a brainstorming or maybe just a break. <laughs> 